Well, hi, this is another one of our recordings from the Honors Humans and the Evolutionary Perspective class from fall 2018. Um, my name is Eric Dewar. I'm Associate Professor of Biology at Suffolk University. And we're recording a series of little roundtables about a book by David Stamos called Evolution and the Big Questions. For this particular chapter, we're interested in his treatment of evolution and feminism. So um, why don't we just go around and introduce the players first? Uh, hi, my name is Lane Kaplan. I'm a sophomore, and and I'm pretty excited to be here, I guess. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Nicholas Colantonio, also a sophomore. Um, I'm Alyssa Del Vecchio. I am a junior here at Suffolk, and I'm a politics, philosophy, and economics major. All right. So let's start in. I mean, the it was a little different from the other chapters that I'd read because he really starts in with what seems like a pretty harsh critique of what he sees as the state of academic feminism, partly from his own point of view, but also from other you know, texts that have been published that are, that are critical of it. Um, who wants to beat this up first? I mean, I have a lot to say about this, um, but coming from a very political and a philosophical background, um, I just had a lot of problems with the way he kind of almost attacked feminism in a way. Um, a lot of the word usage he used was sounded very condescending. Um, I know at one point on page um, 120, he goes, hence, these feminists feel a need for rejecting the biology, either by attacking science as a whole, as a misogynist institution, or by attacking the particular facts and theories upon which sexual dimorphism is based. I just thought that entire sentence as a whole was just very condescending. Like, I don't know about you guys, but it was... I, I hear what you're saying, but I, what I think he was, even though, I mean, I get that, but I think he was sort of saying, these are, this was, that was like the outline of the chapter, though. That was him saying, you know, we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to hit these points, but it made it sound like it's an all encompassing swipe against the discipline. Yeah. I think, I think that, I think that was the way that I would, I would hear that. I, I think you do kind of make a decent point there, but at the same time, like, I feel like a lot of times in the book, the author goes out of his way to use like very big flowery, like academic language that a lot of times does not help his point at all, but instead makes him sound, like you said, rather condescending, like to the point where just reading anything he says, it just makes you feel like he's over-exaggerating to the point where his original point is just completely lost in his flowerful language. Mm -hmm. Did you think that with the other chapter that you read on this so far? Oh, definitely. Okay. I mean... Um, just for context, um, we originally had to read the first chapter of this book, and I, admittedly, I had a lot of trouble reading this book because it does fall into like that, you know, classic academic style of writing, and just the way like the book is written, it's just so densely packed with language that if you miss like even one word, you miss out on like the next few paragraphs and their like central meaning. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's very tedious to follow in okay. a way. And I think that's also part of why, you know, just reading it in general, it's just like just that on top of how his ideas seem very outdated and holier than thou. It's just the piece as a whole is just mm. not a very good piece of writing hmm. as is. All right, then, then rather than attacking the author's tone or voice, why don't we why don't we pick apart the like the contentions that he's bringing to the party? So he portrays an image of academic feminism of one that really seems contrary, you know, contrary or devaluing of information or knowledge that comes from scientific disciplines, sometimes a priori because the whole endeavor is sexist, or just to say that the particular places that academic science, you know, the biology say leads you is problematic for feminism. Is that a, do you think that's a justified kind of claim with the stuff you brought in? Because there was a one, what was the, te the text that he referred to? There was a, there was like one main uh, critique on the, um, on the discipline that he kind of brought, this professing feminism um, textbook, uh, professing feminism book by uh, Pazai and, Kur and Kircher. So, but yeah, sort of, but kind of characterizing it as both uh, kind of a biophobia of the disciplines as well as um, what he claims is, what, what, the, what these other authors claimed is an indoctrination of, of students into this worldview. 
respond to that? Well, I think I just know that throughout the, that whole section of the chapter, he just made it seem like it was just the way that feminists are talked about now is a social construct, and it's all about how, like in feminism classes, the young students are learning that the ma- males or like the other side is the enemy, and if you don't like relate, if they don't relate to you in any way towards feminism, they're automatically wrong. At least that's what I've picked up on throughout that whole section where that's when she he was explaining like the whole biology thing is currently like taken out of it and now all you have is like professors teaching about like all the social reasonings and if any of those social reasonings are like against feminism then the women are automatically going to be against you um i think also with this paragraph in particular there's a part where the author talks about um how um women in childbirth when they go through such intense pain they say that a lot of men don't take them seriously and he says like that's not a thing that happens and i really don't understand where he's getting like that idea from because he doesn't quote like a study or anything in that one specific part where he says that it's all fake he just kind of says, you know, oh, these women are just over-exaggerating. Like, that feels like what he's saying there, in a way. Oh, I 100% agree. And I think it's so ironic because a lot of the times, um, this isn't just um, exclusive to women, but it's um, also, um, this also happens with people of color, where they'll go into emergency rooms and they'll complain about, like, pain, but they won't be taken as seriously as, let's say, a white male. And this is a thing that happens. Um, I can't remember the percentage, um, so please forgive me. Um, but I have read studies basically reporting this exact same thing. So it, he kind of loses credibility when he says, oh, that's just not true. It's really ironic because uh, at one point in the book, he makes an argument saying like, oh, you can't use facts for a political reason or mm-hmm. you can't it, like when he does exactly that. It's just it, it's really ironic. But I will say, I mean, that that section of the text is he's reporting what's coming through that professing feminism book. So that's not him saying, yes, yeah. oh, that, that, that's mm-hmm. he's kind of quoting what's coming out of that book. But like, but what do we think about just. These other these other arguments to the contrary, just to kind of dwell on the the pain of childbirth thing for a second, sort of the the logical outcome of this would be, all right, so we are in a non egalitarian um, culture, so women, you know, I thought his argument was women experience more pain than they would if this were a completely egalitarian or if this were a truly feminist culture. You know, and there are things that we can do to increase the equitability of access to, you know, but is that, is that, a, is that a reasonable way to read that? You know, or about strength of, well, we're going to talk about sexual dimorphism later, I guess. But, um, yeah, so what, what do you think about that sort of idea? I mean, I... So I have to look back into the text for this, but I just know that um, when I was reading it, I didn't quite understand what he was trying to get at. Um, okay, that's right. We can we can circle back on we can circle back on this a little bit if we want. Um, but but as a general prospect, he sets up this. You know, it's an either or between this. You know, using accepting biological explanations or what he calls this, uh, what, what, he, what he recalls other authors call this biophobia. But who's taking, who's taking gender studies classes here? Any of you guys? So I've okay. taken feminist philosophy and women in spirituality as part okay. of my philosophy um, triple disciplinary major, but <laughs> 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 sounds so pretentious, but <laughs> um, I know we don't really go, I mean, we do touch up on uh, the biological factors of like what goes into feminism, but not as deeply as you would in like a women and gender studies class. Mm. It's more so about the um, theories of feminism and how uh, the patriarchy kind of molds them and almost twists them in a way in modern culture. So the way that those are described in, you know, in those classes that you've taken, how does that compare with what the author is representing here? So 
Um, I know a lot of the times in my classes we'll talk about how the um, male uh, how so this one time uh, one of my professors talked about how women language and male language is very different mm. um, just in the words that we use and in uh, the way that we construct arguments. Um, he actually touches up upon this, but um, men are more a little bit more analytical. Um, whereas women are a little bit more creative and intuitive. Um, and then it kind of follows through with the way that we speak and create arguments. Um, but. Hmm. So what's the, what's the solution for that kind of thing? If we have, you know, if we have fields where our language, our, you know, our, our language is going to affect the way that our, the way that people not just understand our ideas, but the way that their ideas hit them. So, you know, what kind of solutions could we propose for doing something about these disciplines that have inherently sexist language? I think the most important thing is having a woman's perspective on this, because with a lot of these um, male dominated fields, you have a small percentage of women who are putting their input, and then you have a mass amount of male voices saying, well, no, you're wrong. And you don't get a lot of the female input that I think is desperately needed, especially in the biological and STEM fields. Mm. This is a bigger problem in STEM in general, um, of what they call the leaky pipeline. I mean, if you look at in my department in biology, about 70% of our students are women. And they, it's, but that's when you look at the professional working biologists, you know, there are women who decide not to go to graduate school, women who um, maybe get a master's degree or a PhD, or maybe they don't work in the field, but they don't work in the field after that. And this is for lots of reasons. You know, sometimes it's, you know, family constraints that bring things in. And then when um, mothers fall off this kind of academic treadmill, then it's hard to catch up with her peers who are, you know, who, who made different decisions. Um, and this is, a, this is a problem that's been I mean, certainly in my own family, this is something that we, you know, we, we talk about a lot because my wife's also a PhD level biologist and, you know, but she, but she wanted to be home with our children when they were little and she found it very difficult to be able to return, um, you know, to, and, you know, and whether she really wanted like a professorial job or a, or a labs or like a bench science job. So that's, and this is, so this is something that we see like a lot, but fixing the problem has been an ongoing, first of all, awareness of the issue is, is high now. You know, but fixing the problem is a, is going to take another generation before we have anything. I mean, in our department, um, you know, half of our faculty are women. You know, which I think is good, mm -hmm. but it's you know, or at least nearly half. It depends on how many we have at any given time. But you know, how we solve the problem for capital S science is not something that like we can do at Suffolk. It's not something that is something that's going to have to be, you know, we have to find equitable solutions um, that are, whether it's done through funding or, you know, changing the way, changing what the work environment is like. Yeah, I mm -hmm. think definitely the work environment is 100% um, one of the biggest factors because um, my mom is a doctor. Um, and when she was rising up through the ranks, she experienced so much sex, um, sexism, sexual harassment just for being a woman. Um, and even in her chem classes in college, her professor told her outright, you're not going to make it because you're a woman. And I'm going to make sure that you don't pass this class because you're a woman. And oh I, I don't think, I mean, there How are... Your mom? She's 55. Okay. Yeah, so it was back um, when sexism was a lot more rampant. I mean, not to say that it's not still rampant today. But it was overt. Then. It was very overt, yeah. and it was okay to do that, which is, I think, utterly horrendous. But um, I think I agree with what you said. Um, we also need to change the workplace environment. Yeah. I mean, my wife always says that, you know, professional science would look really different if, you know, you could have – a little room off your lab where like your kid could hang out and play and maybe you'd have you know fun, funding for students to sort of be able to play with them you can kind of check in during the day and that sort of thing they said you know academic science would look really different if it were more more mom and friend and family friendly but you know that's not the situation that that's not the situation that developed um yeah what else do you want to beat up on this section of the, uh, the section <laughs> of the chapter i i want to talk about how 
for, for some reason, when he talked about, or I don't know if it was him talking about it or if it was from an article, the whole thing about, like, mating and when, like, for an extreme amount of time in history, they thought that the egg was just sitting there and doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And then it just... They found out in, like, 1890 or something that, oh, like, there's, like, little things that go out and grab the sperm cell and bring it in. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't revealed until, like, 1980. And, like, that whole thing is just, like, mind-boggling to me. For, like, 100 years, you keep it, like, not low-key, but, like, not talked about. And then just in general, like, I feel like the act of sex is two people in general and, like, the body, both bodies doing things. So I feel like for it to only be viewed as one person or, like, one biological part for so long is just utterly mind-blowing to me mm -hmm. i mean part of do you want to respond to that first um, um you can say what okay. you want it's fine <laughs> but, I mean, part of it is these things were effectively invisible for a long time you know so getting a and this is we talked about this with the sex chapter as well there's a lot of the development of the understanding the biology of sex is really stunted compared to other aspects of the body just because of the inherent you know, the inherent kind of cultural weirdness that, or at least that Americans have around talking about sex and that's, and, and, and people and scientists who study it are, are kind of, you know, can be kind of cordoned off as looking like they're the weirdos or something. I mean, think of how long Kinsey had to work in private that, you know, before, before any of that stuff got out. Um, but anyway, but, but yeah, but that's, um, in some ways I'm not surprised because the visualizing these little microvilli, like, um, with a microscope, that a lot of the stuff happened in like the 18, 1890s to like 1940s, not just with this, but also with how muscle cells work or how, neuro, how nerve cells work. So this is sort of this grand age of the, the first pass at understanding how these things work. But like if you look in my anatomy physiology textbook that I teach from, a lot of that stuff we've known since like the 1930s, you know, but it's only we're adding on more detail and stuff, but changing the metaphor that is used for how conception in this case happens. Um, that, that was like way longer in coming because it required a lot of really careful cellular biology. And you know, stuff you can, there's stuff you can do in a dish so it's visible, but yeah, doing some, working with the very small and also understanding chemical, the chemical signal traffic that's going between these cells is also, was also very late in coming. So I think it's, part of it is hanging on to old ideas and metaphors that are convenient or compelling, but part of it is also that this is like hard won information that took a really long time for people to really to lock down. I think it's very interesting you say that because in a way that kind of reminds me of evolution in a way when that was coming out because you know before Darwin had like you know had his whole spiel and origin of the series of ocean or excuse me origin of the species. Um, you know, you like you saw even when he wrote it, there were people going, you know, what is this? This is a new idea that I don't know if I can understand. And uh, it's just it's this weird thing in a way that science almost repeats itself throughout a lot of things. And that I do un I do definitely understand your point of um of the fact that science needs to catch up um, a lot of the time and excuse me mm -hmm. and you do have to wait a few years for certain advancements to be made before certain discoveries can be made. But at the same time, I do think there's also like a very um, societal aspect to science. Part of that is, you know, what is the public think should be studied? And then there's also, you know, what do the scientists think should be studied? And just a lot of a lot with that comes, you know, when you are, when you have like, um, I believe you came up with this point where you said um, that more women should be in science, that they could offer their perspective. A lot of times, like way back in the day, you would have like these teams of all me of all men doing these um, like studies on on women, and you can see, like you can see that they that all their prejudices would get in the way of their results. And it's something that even today is still prevalent. And I think people are more conscious of it, but a lot more um, training has to go into, you know, um, being sensitive to that and finding mental ways around it. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And not just sensitive in a squishy way, but mm-hmm. sensitive, like aware of languages being used and thinking and sort of taking the step back. So we, we think about how this is going to be, you know, because like, there's there's what I say, but there's what you hear. We want to make sure that those things are as close to each other as, as, as they can be. Exactly. And I think that's um, kind of what philosophers um, really kind of debate upon with how uh, women and men have very different, uh, have two different, very um, distinct language styles. Mm. So if a man would say something, a woman might interpret that a different way and vice versa. Um, there's almost like a subtle language barrier. Um, I don't like using that term, but that's like one of the only things um, I can kind of compare it to. Yes, it's, that's a penetrating comparison you have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I think it just comes down to like, understanding each side and I think that's a lot of the fact in history at least from not just this book but you see over time that men have not ne- just neglected the women's side for a long period of time and now that it's becoming more way- more aware that you guys are saying and I agree which is very very important it's to a point where now both sides are being understood more and more and it and like the more we do that the better I think it will be on both levels and both for both sides yeah. I mean, we hope so. And of course, this is maybe it's a male argument to say we're talking about generational change, you know, because there was a philosopher of science named Thomas Kuhn. You might have seen, even if you look in science sections of Barnes and Noble, there's a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And part of it is there are long periods of time of what he would call normal science, where people are accumulating information that all kind of that sort of works under a particular model of under our understanding of the natural world. But then there are these revolutions that happen where somebody either rearranges stuff like Darwin did, or new or new facts come into the world. We say, okay, our old explanations don't fit this new stuff that we know. Um, but everybody doesn't just change their mind at once. Some people there are all there'll be a lot of old hangers on to the old ideas because it worked worked well enough before. And just in put it bluntly, what it takes is it takes for the older scientists to leave the discipline, either through retirement or their death, because that's when, and then at that point is when the, the sands kind of shift over to like the next understanding. So in fact, it, paradigm shift sounds like super business school buzzwordy today, <laughs> but it was Kuhn who made it up because basically there's the paradigm of like how we thought, how we thought say um, mutability species worked. Um, before Darwin, and then he shifted over to there's this new way of understanding it, or even bi- biology shifting from a typological discipline where we think of it like in essentialist terms, as opposed to this probabilistic nature of biology today, where we look at well, what what what's our like what's our average value, what kind of variation do we see around that? That's like a that's a really big change that's happened over the last 50 years. But it took 50 years in order for this to be like the status quo in biology or in sciences in general. I agree. Um, And you mentioned the paradigm shift, which is actually a cool segue into what I wanted to uh, touch up upon next. But um, with the paradigm shift, this is another thing that even philosophers have been kind of debating um, in terms of politics is uh, when you have people in their 60s and 70s voting in an election that they might not even be around for. Like, <laughs> it's it's stuff like that where it kind of makes you think, like, should we allow them to? Should we not? Um, should there be an age restriction like we have on younger voters? Mm-hmm. Um, but I know that the author uh, touched up upon the, politi- the political nature of um, biology and feminism, but um, in our culture where women's bodies are still regulated via the law, I think it's inherently politicized. And once you bring biology into that, that biological um, argument becomes political and there's no skirting around it. That's just, I think, how it has to be. Yeah, And there's a certain, uh, there's going to be a certain segment of the population that's going to say, oh, now you're bringing in your scientists, but those people don't really, they don't really understand, like, you know, what our lives are like, you know, and that's, a, and that's another case of what I think is like the otherization of scientists compared to like normal humans. And, um, you know, we are also citizens who vote and stuff. But think about the age restrictions. Our older kid who's in um, eighth grade the other day was complaining. It's like, you know, so these climate reports are coming out and their kids, students learn about this in middle school. And yeah, she's like, mm-hmm. she's like, you know, well, big climate change is going to happen by like 2022. She's like, in 2023, she's like, this is lame. You know, I'm going to be 18 then. I got to live my whole life with the world like this. And you guys got to have the planet where it was nice. <laughs> 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 oh, <yeah. laughs> 
That's funny. (laughs) No, but that really touches up upon a more, I think, pressing issue because you'll have people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and even into their late 90s voting. And you'll have uh, younger generations who are like, well, we don't want this. Why are you voting against what we want? We're the ones that are actually going to have to live through it and deal with your consequences of voting in politicians who don't line up with what our generation thinks. Humans are, we don't, the whole climate change thing, the reason why it's blossomed to the point where it has is because humans are responsive. We're not planners. We, 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 we respond with panic to emergencies. We don't plan to try to head them off because that's just not in our nature. And I think that's part of our biological nature is we don't, you know, the squirrels on the common aren't planning for, you know, aren't, aren't planning for emergencies on the horizon. They're like, what's happening like right now? Or are they responding to this thing that's chasing after them? So, yeah, but what's the thing you want to segue to next? Oh, um, so... Let me <laughs> look. Um, if anyone else wants to jump in while I kind of collect my thoughts okay. a bit. One last shot you want to get in before we, before we change the change the topic on this? Oh, goodness. No, I did have something I wanted to talk about. And then the second you said, do you have something you want to talk about? It just, it's just gone now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm sure we'll edit this out in post. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, like, what what are you trying to get to so I could, like, kind of prephrase it in a way? So I definitely want to um, make a point that, I mean, again, it's going back to the language between this. And I think with academia and language, um, language is a very big part of um, writing. And you have to sort of kind of, I don't want to say pander to, like, all audiences, but academia is supposed to be um, transcendent, and everyone is supposed to be able to um, reach that sort of knowledge. And when you have a reading like this, where it seems like it's only pandering to one audience, specifically males in the science field who are rejecting feminist theory, I think that's where it loses a lot of its credibility in terms of like feminism. Like I, as a feminist and as as pretentious as it says, as a philosopher, um, I think that in order to really give other arguments a chance, you have to sort of not pander to them, but you have to understand where they're coming from. And I think he just completely outwardly rejects any other argument besides from what he's thinking. And it just loses a lot of credibility in my eyes. Interesting. Do you know the exact audience that he, you guys are the exact audience he wrote this for? Really? It's like for like a a general education course about evolution for non-science students, you know? So like this is, you know, somebody asked me if I was going to use this as a textbook next time. You know, which no, 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 I'm not. I don't, I don't know what I'm going to use next time. But just, <laughs> no, but just because it's. Um, but the, like I said, that was. You know, this is the kind of thing that people who want you know, design classes like these, like I did, like this is like this is what this guy's mo is like in class. So basically, it's as though I mean, I'm like this too. Where I think somebody actually just write all this stuff down, and then people could read that, and we do different stuff in class. But um, it's easier just to say it with my mouth. I think, like, he just, like, back to, like, the whole academia thing, and especially in the beginning of the chapter when he was talking about, like, feminism in classrooms and stuff like that, like, he talked about how, like, traditional feminisms used somewhat biology and stuff like that back when they first started, and then, like I said previously, the new um, feminist professors will like to use social arguments and things like that, but, like, he, he, in both ways, he kind of shut both of them down, so it was kind of, like, either one that you want instilled in the classrooms you it still was like wrong in his eyes to some degree i think that's actually really interesting you say that because i'm usually very used to when i think of science i think you know cold hard facts you know i know (laughs) i'm sorry (laughs) it's just you know that's just kind of like you know like the cliche science you get from like you know just your regular physics class in high school oh yeah we hate those guys oh yeah we did (laughs) well you just think it's all like formulas and math and all that stuff and it's like you either know the answer or you don't but in reality science is a lot of like 
philosophy and politics. And they don't really get into that too much because they don't really talk about the history of science outside in high school. I mean, outside of talking about like who invented the microscope or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's like they basically just kind of gloss over that and just say, here's the end result Mm -hmm. of like years of debate and social progress and social regress. And this is what everyone kind of agreed on, if not everyone, at least a majority of people. I mean, first of all, I think all of us are like the products of bad teaching <laughs> from, the, from the past, you know. But one of the things that I love about a class like this, and I'm going to do more of it next semester, I think, is, you know, I like going through a little bit of the history of the development of these ideas because that shows you that these are actual human beings who were working, doing the best they can with the evidence that they had. And I sort of dig that. And But I would say, like, science, I don't think it's just that science, there's a right answer or not, but I think that when I compare... What, what our students do compared to what people do in other majors, I think that science tends to converge on an answer, you know. So and I think he, he talks about this with a, with a different language. But, you know, we are trying to, as opposed to if we're reading a literary text and we want to talk about what's the significance of the color green, of like the green light in The Great Gatsby or something, you know, on the end of the dock. Like the, there are a lot, we, that's like divergent thinking. It could mean springtime, it could mean envy, it could mean all these sorts, but like, but scientists, we tend to try to converge on a single answer, which is part of the reason why there's so much lingo in it. Because, you know, I don't want people, we don't want people to read shades of meaning into words that we use, because we want to make sure we're being clear. Um, although, I gotta say, when I think of, a lot of the tone of this of the beginning part of this chapter is explained by by by, by, by one of the by one of the paragraphs on page one fifteen, basically saying how um, you know they they basically well what is more the student recruits attend classes outside of women's studies and either where either of their own accord or the prompting of women's studies professors they shut down attempts to teach views that are contrary to their easily acquired ideology. <laughs> Then in parentheses, I've experienced myself when I this myself when I taught a course on some of the topics I've covered in the present book, and I, I read I wrote that I wrote the, I wrote the margin. Oh, who hurt you? I mean, just a little bit. So, so, so that that helped to kind of clarify for me kind of where some of this is coming from. Is it's like somebody who's taken their licks. You know, this is like when I work with when I work with creationists. It's sort of you. There are things you kind of got to put on your armor for. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I really just don't, I really wish that you would have provided an example of something like that happening because like, yeah, but it's when, hearsay. Mm-hmm. I, I guess that, I don't yeah. know. Cause like, he just kind of says, you know, yeah. I tried to say something in my class and then this feminist tried to say something yeah. that didn't align with what I wanted to say. Mm-hmm. It's so easy to make a straw you man know? with that though. Yeah, like, you know, I, and I don't want the, I don't want the student to be the straw man, mm-hmm. you know? I get that. Yeah. I think that this happens a lot in any field and I've seen this uh, style of thinking actually emerging more. Um, in the light of this political climate since, I want to say, 2015, 2016. Um, obviously, this book was written Whatever before do you mean? that. <laughs> where it's, well, what I see is what happens all the time. Mm. And it, it's just you can't narrow your thinking like that. And as a scientist, he should know that. Like, you should know that what you see is not the entire story. You need to broaden your thinking. You need to go to different classrooms, go and maybe guest speak at feminist conferences or even just attend them. Yeah, let's start by attending. (laughs) Just attending them. (laughs) I I think that's where it all kind of begins. Once you have this narrow-minded thinking, you kind of shut out any possibility of anything else possibly Hmm. being um, conducive to your argument. You know, I think the biological explanation of this is that we trust our senses and we are accustomed, we are used to this cinematic experience of being alive and we assume that the world as we see it is the world as it is. Now, when people watch television, you watch the screen and we think, oh, the, 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 the world, the world we, the, what we are being shown, this is the world as it is. But there are a lot of levers in editing that happen between or decisions about what's going to get shown on, on the screen before it gets to you, you know, so I think that's where, I think it's also where a lot of people, they, they trust their senses, but they also figure what you see is what you get uncritically when they're watching screens. And so that's, um, I think that's another place where we, you know, where we need to be better with information literacy, need to be more aware of considering the source and not just 
painting with a broad brush, but just in general, whenever we hear, whether it's a, if it's a, a, a speaker who you politically agree with, making sure that we are considering like, is this an argument getting unfairly stacked so that I hear what I want to hear because we know that these echo chambers are real. Um, we have a little bit more time before I want to um, get things wrapped up, but let's, I'm trying to think of other stuff we want to make sure, kind of how this landed. You know, this landed with um, kind of talking about sexual selection as an idea. And we'd certainly learned that sexual selection tends to select for like augmented characteristics in, in individuals, often males. Um, but the, bio, the science of this, and I'd actually forgotten this part, where Darwin sort of threw it out, you know, as being a pioneer on it, but um, it wasn't really, it was kind of poo-pooed for almost 100 years. It wasn't until like the 70s when people started, 1970s, when people really started finding better evidence for this, partly because of the genetic information that was easier to get at. So, you know, where do you think this all lands? So, you know, is, is it just... And have we, has he erected like a straw person by having um, by having feminism as a basically kind of these anti biologists, or is there or, or the, what what are the ideas we should take from like what should the listener take from this? I think the listener should just take in the fact that with any reading um, where they kind of use biology to sort of attack another ideology, I think you should take it very lightly. Um, don't broaden your thinking to just one argument. Um, I That's really all I can say about this. <laughs> Broaden your mind. Yeah, I think the listener should definitely take into consideration, be very critique, like you said, when it comes to things about biology and other things like that, but also have an understanding that n while some of this is, or a lot of this in my eyes, is like very controversial, there are some things you can get out of it where you can see, okay, this kind of makes sense and this doesn't. So I would just be very critique and aware of like the stuff you're reading. Don't hesitate to throw your own opinion in there and see what comes out of that. And also to get just an understanding of like both sides before you just choose one side mm -hmm. or before you just say, oh, no, this is right. I'm going with this no matter what. Mm -hmm. And have an understanding of where both people are coming from. Or like I said, both sides in general. That I definitely understand. And this um, this book in general, it definitely doesn't hit like anywhere near the level of sort of rating like how someone who's like anti-climate change and they say things like volcanoes are the reason that we have climate change and not people. <laughs> it's, it's like nowhere near that, but it definitely has a bit of that feeling of where when the, <coughs> excuse me, when the author talks about biology, there's like a bit of an undertone to it where um, I don't, I don't like, I think what he's saying isn't necessarily completely true, but I don't know enough about biology to dispute it. And I think it's very weird in a way that um, you had that um, Professor Dura had mentioned that um, that this book was made for people, you know, our age that weren't really that into science. But that's still really it just doesn't make sense because I I hate to kind of like harp on his style of writing, but he really doesn't go in depth with a lot of things. I mean, there are certain things, you know, he doesn't have to, you know, like you mm -hmm. know, basic reproduction stuff, sperm and egg, everybody gets that for the most part. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when he starts talking about like all these, like starting, starts quoting all these studies and like all this other stuff, he doesn't go all very in depth with things. And, ah. Uh, I don't I think it's wrong to say that he's scared to because if you ever did like his arguments would fall apart completely but at the same time it's just I think disingenuous is the wrong word again but a lot of it just feels very outdated hmm. in a sense hmm. and that's I think going off that I think that's understanding of science in general like I feel like science is always changing and which, like you said, when two or a group of people condescend towards one answer, I feel like they condescend towards that answer, but with an understanding that 10 years from now, we might have new evidence that could completely change this. And that's mm -hmm. something that a lot of scientists understand and um, need to take with them with their profession. I, I feel like that it's always changing. There's always new data and eventually you'll always have different ideas or, um, or excuse me, different answers. And that just comes with being part of the job, I, I feel like. Mm. Yeah, I mean, well, certainly, but... Actually, some of the you said, Nick, about your um, about having an opinion. I don't want you guys to have opinions about objective things. I want you to have, 
you know, I always tell my students, like, I want you to be people who are convincible by evidence. And I want you to have conclusions. So that when you're coming at, when you're in, uh, in a debate in another class, or in our class, or a different one, I want you to be able to say, basically, I don't just feel this way because I never thought about it before. It's like I've reached a conclusion because I sought out information and I made a judgment. You know, that's what I want. You know, so we can call them opinions, but I always say I want you to think of, you know, opinions are like what kind of ice cream you like better, not, um, you know, your whether you want to decide to agree, agree on things that people have measured. So anyway, that's just where I kind of land with that. But... Anyway, uh, to the listener, thanks very much for joining us today. Um, everybody, everybody say bye. 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 <laughs>